Hey y'all, welcome back to my series. Today we are sitting down with one of the rising photographers in the Carolinas. Most of you guys know him as Squid or Squid Leak. Today we are sitting down with Malik and we are getting to know more about him and his craft and just everything all about him and what's going on. So, hey Squid, how's it going? It's good, it's good, it's good, you know. I'm excited to finally sit down and right. chat it up with Right, long time coming with this. Yeah, long time coming. But we're finally here, y'all. So I'd love to just kind of start off my interviews with getting to know more about my guests. Do you mind letting us know who was Squid growing up, like early childhood, high school? What were you into? What were the early days for you? It's like I was a nerd, kind of. Like, I still am, but I was really into school and like video games. I wanted to be a doctor, so I went to college for like pre med and got a biology degree, but I did not use it. So I feel like growing up, I was really focused on studies and video games. I did sports for a little bit, I did a lot of wrestling and football, I did track, but I was pretty pretty normal. I mean, I was always creative, but school and video games pretty much. You said you wanted to study to become a doctor. Did you end up studying for that in Yeah, college? I went to college in Charleston for four years, and I did four years of pre-med and got a biology degree, but as you can see, I'm not using that mm. degree at all. I mean, I, who knows, I might go do it one day in the future, but that was really my goal. I wanted to um, become like a research doctor or something like that, mm -hmm. kind of like forensics. But I got the degree and halfway, really halfway through college, I realized that like, I wanted to pursue photography instead. So I kind of just finished it out just because, just so it wouldn't be a waste, but. You could still use it one day, you never know. Definitely can, not yeah. At least I got it in my back pocket, you know. Yeah, you just said kind of halfway through college is kind of when you started to pick up the interest in photography. What kind of time frame was that? Like what year? I started like doing photography and videography really in like 2014, 15. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a camera until 2016, 2017. It's actually a funny story. I got that camera, my first camera I bought myself, I was working at Foot Locker and my first check I split with my mom mm -hmm. to go, buy, go out and buy a Canon, Canon T3R T or something like that. And that's when I started shooting, and I would just shoot my friends. But then I took my camera to college, and then they were giving out like these um, these Care Act like checks during COVID. Mm -hmm. I took the whole check and bought another camera. Mm -hmm. And then you went to college during COVID. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, I was in my I was like a sophomore in college during COVID, so I took that and bought another camera. And then I was like, all right, if I'm gonna spend all this money on a camera, like I gotta take it serious. And then went on from there. I think a lot of people's interests and funds were funded through those COVID stimulus checks. Oh, check. most definitely. But listen, we were all rich. Yes, we were all everybody balling. was rich. What type of cameras did you buy at the time? Uh, so I had a T3i and I bought a 6D Mark II. Mm -hmm. And that was the camera I literally have been using until maybe last year when I picked up like film. And then obviously um, I shoot Sony with my job, but I was shooting with the Canon 6D Mark II and like a 35 millimeter Sigma lens for about four years, four or five years until then. Can you like walk us through the process of just taking pictures just to do it, like always having the camera on you versus like it growing into you always having the camera when you go out and then like a genuine interest, like what did that look like for you? So when I first got the T3i, I was really doing video because I wanted to be a YouTuber like everybody. I was making sneaker reviews on YouTube, which you could probably still find them on my page, but they were bad, they were very bad. There was a friend group I had in like, um, Cozy actually. We grew up in the same city, got our cameras at the same time, ironically. But we um, had a friend group and like people in the group made music and made clothes, did a lot of things. So like we would just have our cameras with us whenever we go places and take pictures of each other. And then, you know, just doing that over and over, you kind of, start getting better and finding finding it more interesting trying to figure out new ways to do things wanting to get more gear mm -hmm. and then we both ended up buying the same 6d mark ii in college at the same time then the same lens again and i guess after that we would kind of come back like during breaks and we'd shoot with each other and we'd send pictures while we was in college and then obviously we were in college with a camera it's a lot of opportunities to take pictures in college like you got sports teams you got events you got anything so I started shooting for the school, so I would um, shoot the basketball team. I was in different like organizations, like 
the Black Student Union, I would shoot the fashion show every year. COVID happened and we got kicked out of school. So everybody came back to the city, which meant like, all right, now we got all these like newfound talents, I guess you want to say. As the, the, like, the little COVID stuff started to lift a little bit, we didn't go back to school, but you know, you could be out more. Um, <clears throat> I was working with another one of my friends that um, works for artists and he was doing music videos. So he like called me and Cozy in to shoot BTS for music videos. Mm -hmm. And that really started to pick up and we were getting money for it. And we were working with different artists in the city in Charlotte before we lived here or before I lived here. So I saw that as an opportunity. I'm like, all right, well, you know, I'm 18, 19 years old, already in these spaces with these people. Like, if I keep doing this, who knows where it could go? So I kept doing that. Went back to school after COVID and was like, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna finish, but I feel like I'm gonna go back and continue doing what I was doing during COVID, at least to like a bigger degree. And it's working out so far, so mm -hmm. yeah. That's what really changed it for me. When you mentioned like shooting music videos, that reminds me of when I interviewed Cozy and he told me about Mirror. And yeah. I didn't know, but shout out, shout out Mirror and free Mirror till it's back. Very soon, very soon. He's coming home very, very soon. soon. Two Six Project, you know, I yeah. watched that interview and um, you know, shout out on IG Live. I'll link it down below. But I did learn through that interview that you did attend College of Charleston for the full four years. Right. And if y'all didn't know, I am a data analyst. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's going out of focus again. I can see it kind of twitching out. Okay. Okay. My bad, y'all. We had to switch some things around. But as I was saying, I am a data analyst, so I did bring some data with me about your college. Okay. And I wanted to ask, you'll see, I wanted to ask something about it. So, Charleston in 2022, the city had 72% white population and 18% black. Oh my God. Yeah, so I bring that up because I wanted to ask, how was your experience going to a college in Charleston? And as someone who was into so many like artistic, creative things, did you have a good community around you? Like kind of what was your college experience like being in a city that is so predominantly white? That's such a great question because there's a lot that goes into it. So like College of Charleston, well Charleston itself is very gentrified in some places. Like you can go from being in a very nice part of Charleston to being in a rural part like that, like a block. Like you can walk. Like when I lived in an apartment that was in downtown Charleston and literally right next to my apartment, it was nothing but abandoned houses and rundown and like rural areas basically. So um, not only was the city very white, but I went to a PWI, which I'm not gonna say I regret, but it was an interesting experience. So Calder Charleston was predominantly white and also predominantly female. So like it was a weird dynamic when it came to like the people I would hang around. Um, when I first got there, I had a lot of white friends because that's all there was. And I was in like, um, the, like the classes I was in, wasn't a lot of black students in pre-med classes, at least not at that school. Um, however, like there was this crazy incident that happened. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but my first year or first, first or second year, this guy that I had a, um, a politics, a political science class with, we would study and he was cool. And then like one day on his snap story, he was like riding through a plantation, like yelling the N-word. And I'm like, dang bro, I oh. thought we was, I thought we was cool. Clearly we were not. But like ever since that little incident, the black students had a protest on campus and they got expelled. And like ever since that day, like my white friends kind of dwindled away like every day. I yeah, guess as it, they should, sorry y'all. It kind of it <laughs> like should. divided the school, but in a, I mean, beneficial to me, I didn't really know a lot about the black community when I came in. My first friend was um, this black girl named Sierra that did my hair the first time I got there. I didn't know any black students, so she was the first one I met. And she introduced me to like um, the black student union and all the other black students. And that black community over time, got bigger and bigger and I really didn't interact with that many white people. Like leading up to my um, graduation, all my friends were people of color. Um, I was in a, people don't know this, but I'm Hispanic. So I was in like this Hispanic club as well. Also in the West Student Union. So I had a lot of more cultured friends and community around me. I will, I will say Charleston shaped my like 
creative identity in a way. Um, I wasn't, I don't think I was as conceptual until I got to college and I met all these creative and different individuals because College of Charleston is a liber liberal arts school so like they're really big on the arts and I was like the lead photographer for the magazine for the school too um, which was weird because it was edited, like the editor was a white girl and she didn't really like my work because it was very black and all this other stuff but that's a story for another day um, but I ended up it really ended up shaping my creative identity because I got way more conceptual in my work. I worked with a lot of models. Luckily, every friend I met was a beautiful human, so I had people to shoot all the time. My first project that I shot there got put in a museum, in, in a, or I think it was a, I don't know if it's a museum, but it's like a history center, the Avery in Charleston. There was an exhibit that it was in. Um, obviously, so I was working with the Black Student Union, I got connected with a lot of um, historic like black figures so I really my art identity now is extremely cultural and black and I feel like that's where it really stemmed from because Charleston has a lot of history a lot of black history like the school itself was built by slaves and you can see like slave fingerprints on the bricks on campus wherever you go so I don't know if it was just the environment or like the spirits or whatever or what it was it really shaped how I became so um, what's the word I want to use interested, I guess, or intrigued in black culture and why my, my art kind of heavily um, exudes that. So I think that's where that's where it came from coming. That's why it's so ironic that it's a white school, but it really shaped how much I am more inclined to shoot black people and the community I built around me there. So. Yeah, for sure. I think a, a lot of people do kind of conform where they're placed in, like they might end up being just like the rest of them, but some people like you, you're kind of like pushed to really like this is a test like do you really want to learn about you and represent your people or do you want to conform to the the rest so because I'm sure there were a lot of you know black people minorities people of color on campus who were just like just like the rest of everybody yeah, else like oh, they had no identity whatsoever mm -hmm. it was hard to find that group because um, they the black community when I was there at first was very tucked away like I don't want to say it was hidden, but like there wasn't really promoted to black students because it was such a, it felt like they didn't want to show that side of school for some reason. Like they wouldn't even, they'd have events, they wouldn't show any of the black Greeks. They would only show the white Greek people. And you know, the Divine Nine is very different than like what they have over there. So I don't want to say I pioneered it. The content we were producing for these black organizations that I was a part of, we started to really try to push it more and like the, 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 the campus had no choice but to acknowledge it because we was doing good stuff. Like we was making fashion shows, getting more views than we had ever gotten in the past years. Like the content looked great. And ever since I left, they've been carrying that on. Like it's, the black community there is more, way more vibrant than it ever was. So I feel like I came in at a good time. It started to pick up a lot more. And I'm sure you set the tone very well for the students and the to. people who don't know you, I mean, it makes a big difference yeah, I'm not taking to credit. their experience. Just saying, just He's saying. not taking credit, but he did it. Oh, I love the song. See, I told you, they've been distracting me sometimes. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, early on with photography, what were some weaknesses that you had or things that you weren't that skilled in? Now you would say, like, you're pretty good at, like, what were the main things that you're like, damn, I keep messing up with this? Like, because for me, when I shoot digital, I don't know what I'm doing with the the triangle, the tri ISO. Oh my uh, God, can I explain it real quick? Please, let, okay. let the people know. This is a, a great way for people to understand like the exposure triangle. You only gotta put this in, but like. Mm -hmm. No, I I'm, was, gonna, I'm gonna keep I, it. I, really, I struggle I with that too, but I picked up on it really quickly because it's almost like you're just compensating every time. Like, obviously they say the last thing you wanna touch is your ISO because that adds like grain and stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, what I always do is if you shoot on any kind of priority setting, in the beginning I shot on like, aperture priority so it would keep my aperture at a certain thing and change the other stuff really that's how you learn because if you want like a really shallow background you keep your aperture as open as possible but since you're doing that a lot of light is coming in so you got to bump your shutter speed or stuff like that so you're just really adding and subtracting light and it is complicated but i feel like if you just stay in that one of those priority settings and you notice how it the camera will change the settings for you once you just pay attention to how it kind of makes those adjustments, it'll make so much sense. Like that was, I'll say that that's one of them because exposure is difficult. Like yeah. until like shooting film, I feel like helped me really understand it more. But like the same for me when I first started shooting digital, 
the exposure shit. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I can cut. For me, but. it's like everything will look good, but it takes so long to take the picture. Yeah. And then it's blurry, but in the viewfinder, it's so crisp. I'm mm -hmm. like, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> what am I, I doing wrong? Know, I think, technically wise, technical wise, it was definitely exposure was one of them. Um, but I think the the thing I struggled with most was just like my confidence as an artist. Like, I used to be very self conscious about what people would think about like how my pictures would look and stuff like that. Like I would care about likes and then like validation almost. I think confidence would be one and then composition for sure. Because I feel like people get so caught up in like the gear you use and like your subject. But like composing a good image can go a long way because you can take a picture of Drake, but like if he's like cut off somewhere, like top of his head, like people are gonna like it, but it's not gonna be as good as if you know, he's composed well or something like that. And I think shooting shows really helped me, like, force me to think outside the box when it comes to composition, because we're all shooting the same artist on a stage where most of the time, unless you're a headliner, there's nothing behind them. It's just light or a black screen, so you gotta do something to make the picture look cool. So composition, I feel like, is really important. That's something I struggled with for a long time, and I've been working on, for sure. The mental thing that you mentioned is so big even these days because... Can I put on a carpet? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think my lips are No chapped. dry lips over here, y'all. No, can't have that. I think the whole mental thing is something that's so big even these days because sometimes I'll have conversations with people that I don't really know like that and they're asking me about these interviews and it's this person and they're like, oh, well, I started taking pictures and people weren't liking it and I'm like, you only took pictures twice, like you need to keep doing it. But social media is just a platform for you to promote your stuff. It shouldn't, you shouldn't use it as validation, I guess. Like, I, I feel like the, the subject matters, but it doesn't matter. Like, you still gotta make a good image. If you focus on only wanting to shoot, like, the biggest people, that's hard. Like, you're not gonna get those opportunities every day. Like, you'll be waiting your whole life to shoot Drake, and then you shoot Drake and you have no experience shooting people, so now the picture don't even look good. So you gotta shoot with the local people because a lot of times you build those relationships, you never know where these, where they can go. Like, if you genuinely like somebody's music that lives in the city, even if they're not famous, like work with them. Cause you could, you guys can help each other, you know what I'm saying? You build them up, they build you up. And now you got a lifelong connection for the rest of your life and you got to document this person's story, so. Talking about mastering your weaknesses and everything like that, seems like you learned so much to add to your resume that made you who you are today with your crafts, which eventually got you to the Whitaker Group. Mm, so yeah. can you tell us about how, just your interest in applying, like what made you want to work for Whitaker Group and just like your experience working there and everything like that? When we were when we were younger, we would always go, me and my friends would always go up to Charlotte and go to Social Status like all the time. Um, that was a long time ago before we even knew what the Whitaker Group was like as a whole. And then Cozy found the listing online. They posted on Instagram, they were looking for e-com photographers. And at that time, I was still living in Charleston. We had both graduated, but I didn't move back to Charlotte until a year and a half after I graduated. I stayed in Charleston for a year. So um, I had a job up there and I could have left, but I was, did not want to leave Charleston. I love Charleston so much and I still didn't want to leave now, but I'm glad I came because it did a lot for me. But he ended up getting the job and then maybe a few months you made three, four months after that, I ended up moving back. So I applied and since he was in there, you know, he get, told him, like told him I was good, put in a good word for me. They picked my resume, so I was good. You know, I had experience with photography and Photoshop and stuff like that. I got an interview and I got in, but I got in as an editor, not a photographer. So I was kind of, for about six to eight months, I wasn't shooting anything, I was just editing like e-com, like editing t-shirts off of a mannequin is what I was doing. So I wasn't shooting for a long time. At the time, the creative director like saw my work when I got hired and he was like, you know, if you're ever interested in shooting something, just let me know, we'll see if we can get you an opportunity. So I did and then ever since that day, you know what I'm saying, I feel like I produced well enough to where they would let me come in and shoot every once in a while, shoot some brands here, uh, work on different sets. So I never actually became a real photographer for them. I'm still an editor to this day, but I just kind of shoot whenever they need me to or whenever there's an opportunity. But that's what I led to. I got a lot of opportunities from them working with those different brands. So it's really cool. We can talk about festivals and concerts. Oh, yeah. Cause you've kind of been doing that more as of recent, you know, shooting festivals and 
I kind of just wanted to learn more about that. So, like, what was like the first show that you shot? Uh, I guess. I mean, I know sometimes you do it like in the audience, which is great. Yeah, and that's what I was should about do, to say. Should try that more. Like, you don't always have to get a media pass, but maybe tell us like the first shows or show show or shows that you shot, just in the pit, whatever. But then, like, actually getting a media pass, like, what was that? Okay. Journey like for you starting to shoot shows and everything. So my first show that I shot, jeez, I want to say was this show in Spartanburg. It was like a fashion show, but they had performances where um, Columbia artist PG Raw was there and Seti Hendrix. Like first actual show that I shot with a media pass, or actually it wasn't even my media pass, but I got in the pit, was a, the Futures and Friends show at the Spectrum. That was the first actual show that I shot from the pit. A little bait and switch with one of my friends who got a media and then a he got a pit pass and then a media pass. The media pass was for like a writer and then there was a pit pass, but I just kind of went down there with the media pass and it worked. So a lot of times you got to finish your way into the pit, but that's that was the first time. Um, but I think my first actual media pass that was for me was a Tia Kareen show uh, where Key Glock was on tour. I got media for that one. And what have you kind of like learned through shooting shows? Cause like you alluded to earlier, like the composition with an artist, like it's so different than people standing in front of you or product or nature like what are some of the things that were like whoa they're moving too fast or like what you know have you learned from shooting shows one being creative and two like you're gonna take a lot of pictures mm -hmm. <laughs> like they're they are moving a lot sometimes the lighting is horrible you got to make it work with what you have like a lot of times unless it's the headlining artist they're not gonna have light that shines on them. It's gonna be like maybe one spotlight or a headlight, which lighting at a show is like the number one image maker. Like a lot of, there's some artists that have really, really good, um, I don't even know what you call them. I, I would say gaffers, but I don't know if that's what you call them. But the people that do their lights, some artists have really good ones. Like I went to a, I shot a Majid Jordan show and that was probably some of the best light I've ever seen at a show. So you need, like they always want their um, artists to look a certain way and their lighting, you know, portrays that way. When they send you a deck of how they want you to shoot the artist, they'll explain to you like our lighting is set up this way, this is how you're supposed to shoot them. But sometimes if you're doing like show like the future, um, the future show, the non-headliners are not going to have good light. So you got to really be creative and you got to, like I talk about, comp compose them in a certain way to make the picture interesting because you don't just want to take a boring image like, yes, a picture of an artist that's popular is gonna like, people are gonna like it, mm -hmm. but you wanna go a little bit over that. You don't just wanna take a normal like picture of someone just standing there. You wanna make them look cool too because when artists think they look cool and they think you make them look cool, they gonna like you. Mm -hmm. And they gonna want those pictures and they gonna want you to take more pictures of them because they wanna look cool. At the end of the day, you just gotta make people look cool. So I think I learned to just find ways to make images stand out that's not just a normal, you know, portrait. Like, compose it differently, try different angles, try different focal lengths, try different shutter speeds, like make it look cool. And then a lot of post editing, you know, make it look cool, like frame it a certain way, add certain effects to it. So just a lot of different things. It helped me become like a lot more creative, especially in the moment when, you know, everything's real fast paced. And I hear you have a interesting story about Dreamville. Oh my God, <laughs> the most interesting story. Um, I guess like Dreamville in a whole is a very, Felt like destiny, I'm not gonna lie. Like, it felt like it was supposed to happen. Cause I've been to every Dreamville. J. Cole was my favorite artist. Was? Yeah. Um, he's still my number two. It's just Kendrick kinda. Oh my God. <laughs> look, I, <laughs> it sounds bad, but it's just, they were my number, they were my one and two for the longest. You're right. But then like, you know, recent, um, events, events, kind of. Oh my flipped. god, that's he's still, crazy! He's still, my, he's still my guy. I still, yeah. I still rock with Cole. He was still my favorite artist. I ain't gonna say that, but my favorite rapper is Kendrick. But I'll say right. Kendrick, J Cole, my favorite artist. So like, I've been to every Dreamville, but I've never paid for a ticket before because the first time I went, my brother was an ambassador, and he got an extra ticket, so he gave it to me. Second time, the same thing happened. So he gave me a ticket again. 
After the second time, I was like, you know what? The next time I come to this festival, I'm gonna have my camera. Because the first, the first year, I wasn't shooting that much. I think that was what, like 2017 or 2018 was the first show. And that's right when I got like really into photography. So I wasn't really thinking about shooting a show. Um, but then um, 20, the next one happened. And that's when I was really getting into it. So then I said, by the third one, I'm gonna be shooting this. And luckily, um, I think Cozy got a pass and he snuck my camera in with him. And we snuck into the VIP section and we stood there for the entire festival. Like the one, one water bottle and story. One, one water bottle that we shared. We did not. Oh, what did he, he didn't tell me that. Yes, like there's a little, or we the had our individual water bottles, but like when one ran out, like if I had water, we yeah. give it to bro, because oh my god, it was bad. we didn't eat the whole day. We ate a big meal before we went. I think we had Bojangles. We had Bojangles yeah. before we went in, and then the one time we had Red Robin, which they had this crazy burger that was OD. So oh, we had a burger okay. before we went in. I know it sounds well, but that's a crazy post festival yeah. meal. Well, it was before the festival, or yeah, we had to have Red Robin before because we knew we weren't gonna leave the pit to get right. food or leave the VIP to get food. So we stood there, whole festival, shot from the crowd for two days, feet hurting like crazy, like dehydrated when you leave, hungry as hell. Like, it was the worst thing ever. And then um, luckily the following year, opportunity from my boy, Mike Jones. He luckily um, got media passes for me the next year. So it all ended up working out and now I feel like next year that I've been there like there's no way that it's not going something gonna shake you know next year it has to like it's happened every year so it's just weird how we ended up having to sit in that pit and we got pictures that people in the pit couldn't even get or sitting in the VIP we got pictures that people in the pit couldn't get because certain um, artists they don't let anyone in the pit shoot so we got pictures of Drake and um, Lil Wayne that some of the people that had media pass couldn't get because we were in the crowd and we had like zoom lenses and we had to crop a lot, but it worked out. We got good pictures, you know what I'm saying? They did well on Insta and everything. And then I guess, you know, people started seeing it. It definitely got us more opportunities or more like more opportunities to shoot other shows and stuff. So it was a crazy event. My feet was hurting so bad. It was so crazy. One water bottle and Red Robin is insane. Red Robin, I had the Robin, the Red Robin, like they signature burger with an egg on it. That's what it was. So if you want a victory meal, you should get that. <laughs> a red robin burger with an egg. So he had lunch and breakfast all in one. All in one. And I didn't eat it again for the rest of the day. So y'all couldn't, do you guys have to like rush to the pit, media pit? Cause like what, could y'all have like bought food and just walked over there? Well, if we were in the pit, like the actual media pit, the photo pit, we would have been fine. You can go in, like there's no, no blocking that. You can go in whenever you want. And they only let you in for like the first three songs mm -hmm. and you got to get out. So we, what we did was we snuck into the VIP section and we just got there so early that like nobody was there. So we went up to where the railing was um, and we just stayed in that one spot the whole day. Yeah. We didn't move. Cause if we did- You don't want to risk leaving right, in your You don't want right. to risk moving. It want to be as close as possible. So we, could, we were technically shooting from the pit. We were just behind the rail. Right, so right. It worked out. I can't wait to see next year. Oh, me either, yeah. Okay. Cause All those right. pictures were I, I really vividly remember the Drake pictures that everyone took so well that night, but they looked Thank amazing. You. Thank you very much. And let's talk about um, the short films that you've been doing that you've showcased on Instagram where you're showing us the pictures that you're taking, but also like documenting almost like the process as well as just really capturing your subject beautifully through video. So if you could walk us through your interest in doing that in a time where short form content is all the rage. What made you want to really highlight photography in a videography way, but like really slow and curated, like a short film kind of video thing? Um, I'll tell you why, too. I guess I've always been really interested in video. Like, like I started doing video more. I felt like I was getting really stale when it came to photography. Like I felt like everything I was doing was kind of boring. And I was like, all right, maybe I should explore other mediums and that might like spark something in me. So I started reading books, started watching movies. I started uh, listening to more music. I always loved music, but then I was like, all right, let me try 
something that's like really similar to photography, but a little bit like a little different. And like videography and, video and photography to me, like go hand in hand because they're both images. Mm -hmm. And if, I don't know if people notice, but like when I make my videos, I try to make still images. Like I don't do a lot of movement because I want it to almost feel like an image, mm -hmm. but like a, a moving image, which is like what a movie is. So I do a lot of tripod, a lot of still images, um, but I'm really just trying to, I was telling you that I was struggling with like composition and I feel like doing video is really helping me think about composition in a different way. Like putting my model somewhere in frame that's not typical or still looks like flattering, you know, trying to add like subtleties to different compositions, like stuff that maybe the, the you know, the typical watcher probably wouldn't even notice, but something that I feel like just adds some kind of different subconscious um, like satisfaction in a way. So I'm trying to work on composition and then also I want to work on being able to tell stories with my work because when I first started shooting, I feel like I was really big on, you know, having concepts and stories behind my images. Now I feel like it's becoming a little more like robotic. So I'm trying to get back to that and kind of conceptualize a little more. And video is helping me do that because even though these videos don't necessarily have a concept behind them, they're just me putting frames together. It's kind of building an identity and a style that I want to have for like my future videos. And now I'm working on stuff that's more narrative driven and you know having more of a story to it and like i didn't used to like write out anything but like now i have a notebook where i'm gonna start writing out like frames and like sequencing things and actually having a story behind it so it can you know be more like typically now what i'll do is i'll film it and then what does it feel like i'll give it a story like the last one i posted with um maya and the girl with the cigarette that didn't have a story behind it, but I added some sound design and now it had a story like she missed the bus or something like that. But that was like, that came up after I shot it already. So I'm like, all right, now that I can do that, like why not build a story before then try to go out and, you know, film something that kind of goes with it. So that's why I'm doing it. And then what was the second part? <laughs> I, um, I think I might answer it, but I <laughs> I forgot because yeah. I was telling him earlier I left all these questions at work so I kind of just had to like so I kind of made that one on the spot but you know what I'm gonna say that you didn't answer it because you gave me a great answer yeah okay okay I try all right. but yeah that's that's where that's why and that's kind of where it's starting from mm -hmm. but we're very excited to see what these new videos look like yes. when you talk about like talking frame by frame I know Tyler the creator has like a moleskin uh, journal notebook thing and he's OD. This is like cherry bomb era. I remember he took a picture for Instagram and he literally draws like rectangles and he draws like what he wants it to look like and yeah. like colors it and everything. I, I ain't gonna color it. <laughs> but I'm really thinking like I need to visualize stuff because I feel like it's easier to frame something and then explain it to like your mm -hmm. model or if you're directing and you have a different DP, if you have it written out or at least an example, it's a lot easier for them to grasp what you're trying to go for. So like, obviously I'm directing and DP and all of my stuff right now, but in the future I might need to have somebody else, you know, record and I direct. So I need to figure out how to sequence stuff on paper or electronically so I can explain it. And again, then have something to reference in the moment and, you know, make changes if need, need be. Yeah, almost like a script. Yeah, literally like a like playbook a script, or like, something. Well, I've got two more for you, okay. I'm ready, I'm ready. Um. First, I want to talk about what are your favorite things and least favorite things about shooting film and shooting digital? Um, I hate digital. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I don't hate digital. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. no um, I love digital. It's just, uh, I feel like a lot of other like photographers that maybe switch to film can probably like attest to this, but shooting digital gets very stale because it's like, effortless in a sense like you're just shooting and if you mess up you can just oh let me redo that or you can look at what you're doing before um i'm gonna like i just feel like film feels more like you're making an image than taking an image like digital you're taking a picture but film you're making it because you know you're exposing that silver sofa sheet of film to light and then you're closing it and you're sending it off to get developed and they're scanning it 
and don't, don't, imagine you scan and develop your own film. You put it in developer for 30 seconds and do all the turns and you dry it and you scan it and you edit it and you post it. Like that process adds to it. And since it's so like costly and you know rigorous, you almost treat every image like a piece of gold. So you're trying your hardest to make sure every image comes out. And then like for me, I stopped shooting 35 millimeter a while ago, which I'm mad that I did that. And I'm trying to get back into it because it's way more cost effective. And it's like the same thing. I just love film, but I've been shooting medium format and the camera I shoot on, you only get 10 pictures. The roll is 20 bucks. It costs 20 to get it developed. So that's 40 bucks per 10 pictures, which is crazy. Yeah. So like, I'm, that's in the back of my head every time I pull out that camera. So now I'm trying to perfectly compose, focus, think about what I want this image to look like every pictures. And it's like before it would take me weeks and weeks to finish a roll of film. But like now I feel like I'm shooting so intentionally like that like, okay, I might shoot five pictures this one day, put the camera down for like a month and then finish it again. But I know every like all 10 of those images are gonna be like images that I would be proud of. So I think the best part about film is how intentional it is, like the colors, the tones, the, the process of shooting film just feels so nostalgic and it feels like you're making something. The worst part is that shit is mad expensive. I don't know if I can cuss, but. Yeah, you can. Oh okay, yeah, that shit is mad expensive. So that's the worst part. Digital, I love how capable it is like especially Sony shooting concerts, you really see how you can push these cameras. Like you're shooting concerts at like 3000, 5000 ISO and they still look crispy. So that's probably my best part is like the, how capable and like um, diverse you can do with a digital camera. You can still shoot a show with a film camera, obviously, but like just the convenience of it. But my least part, my least part um, is like just digital just feels very stale now. And I guess it's, Kind of because it's become like a second nature, like robotic thing. Like for work, when we shoot a brand, you know, you're shooting your brand. You have nine days to conceptualize, shoot it and turn it in. A lot of times we're shooting something, editing it in a day or two and turn it in and then turn around and shooting something again. So it's like a cycle and they kind of like, you turn your brain off and now you're just like, all right, I need to make this like look good, but I also got to do it efficiently. And it gets kind of like, I don't want to say boring, but being able to slow down and take an image on film and like feeling like it's like a tangible item almost. And like getting film printed feels great too. So like it feels more tangible, more like, ex what's the word I want to talk? I don't know the word I want to use, but it just feels more like it's like something that's being made rather than just produced. It's like your kid and you're sending, yeah. once you get it developed, it's like. And then waiting on it, it's like Christmas it when you finally get that email from not bigs, but Yes. Oh. You heard it here first. They don't develop 120 anymore. I don't know why. Oh. So I stopped shooting. Well, I take my 35 to them if I do a point and shoot, but so I can't go to Biggs anymore. But I go to Picture House in New York. They're really okay. good. Yeah, I send my film out. This is a great wrap up question. But what is something or some things that you learned about yourself throughout this whole process? Ooh. What did I learn about myself? Hmm, what did I learn? I guess I learned how much I value like people and friendships and stuff. Like I feel like my favorite thing to shoot is people because I like love people's stories and stuff like that. And I know people like to say I don't have, people be like, yeah, like I have acquaintances, I don't have friends. Like nah, I feel like a lot of people that I've met, I would genuinely call my friends because I don't hang around people that's not good people. At least I don't think they are at least. I don't think they're bad people. So I feel like I learned how much I really value like friendships and relationships with people because um, like you always learn something. One, you can learn something from everyone you meet and like everyone has such a different and unique walk in life and perspective. And I feel like meeting and learning from so many people can like open your mind up to see things in ways you never thought you could, which is like that helped me get more involved in like international issues, free Palestine by the way. Um, like I just been more inclined to learning about other cultures and learning about other people and it helped me be like more aware so like I'm really aware of my relationships with people and like how they may see certain things how I may see certain things and I feel like it affects 
like how I act in public and on social media because like one thing you post may offend somebody. So I just really think about stuff like that. And I think about how it can affect my friendships and relationships. So I guess I, over time I got taught how to, um, taught how much I care about those relationships. Which is like my first photo book is gonna be based about like friendships and stuff. So I'm working on it for a while. It's nowhere near finished, but I think that's probably what I learned the most. I was looking to ask if you would consider making a book. Very soon. It's been, I've been working on it for years now, but I don't take know as much when time it's ever as you need, don't drop. rush it. Huh? I said, take as much time as you yeah. need, don't rush it. It may never drop. I don't know. It's just like no, the concept is so vast, <laughs> I don't know if I can even complete it, but yeah. it'll happen, I hope, eventually. Number one, sign copies in Charlotte. Sign copies at Big's camera. <laughs> <laughs> shout out Big, shout out Big. I don't hate y'all for real, I promise. But, okay, well, I feel like we've got to learn about you. Here's some stories we've never heard before. Yeah. Anything I didn't ask that you want to talk about? No, we talked about the beef. That's really all I was going to bring up myself. So I'm good. I'm, I'm Sweet. Living. Okay, well, cool. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of my interview series. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And check out Squid. I will have everything of his down below. Squid leak on Instagram and Squid Leaks website. But yeah, that wraps it up for another video. Thank you guys for tuning in. Shout out hours. That's all I wanna say, that's it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys in the next one.